So hi, uh, my name is Tristan Slominski, and today I will talk to you about why SLOs are useful. First, a quick overview of what a service level objective is. A service level objective consists of three parts, uh, the percent, the noun and verb with an optional within clause, and a period. Uh, I'm a fan of this particular table format because it highlights the relevant information without anybody having to twist words into a sentence. Um, I can present this and all of you can make a sentence in your head. And I found most people tend to forget bits and pieces of it like the period. You're probably used to this meaning something like a performance of the system, of reliability of the system, but I'm, I'm not attributing any meaning to it. I'm saying this is the specific artifact with these data points. And we're, we'll worry about meaning later. Now, this presentation is going to feel a little bit like this, meaning this is what I'm going to look like to you. And it's going to feel a little bit all over the place, so I want to give you a heads up. But uh, I promise I'm going to tie all of this together towards the end. Um, it's an artifact that a lot of concepts here are coming from multiple disciplines that don't usually overlap. So let's get started with an expert from, excerpt from Mark Burgess's In Search of Cent Certainty, The Science of Our Information Infrastructure. Imagine a scene in a movie. A quiet night on the ocean on the deck of a magnificent ship sailing dreamily into destiny. Moonlight reflects a calm pond that stretches off into the distance, waves lap serenely against the bow of the ship, and had there been crickets on the ocean, we would have heard that reassuring purring of the night to calm the senses. The captain, replete with perfectly adjusted uniform, comes up to the night helmsman and asks, how goes it, sailor? To which the sailor replies, no problem, all's quiet, sir making a small course correction, everything's ship shape and under control. At this moment, the soundtrack stirs, swelling into darker tones, because we know that those famous last words are a sign of trouble in any Hollywood script. At that very moment, the camera seems to dive into the helmsman's body, swimming frantically along his arteries and his bloodstream to a cavernous opening where we view a deadly parasite within him that will kill him within the hour. Then the camera pulls back out and pans out, rising above the ship, up into the air, to an altitude at which the clear still pond on the ocean seems to freckle and soon becomes obscured by clouds. The calm sea, it turns out, is just the trough of a massive wave that miles away reaches up 10 times the height of the ship and it's racing across the planet with imminent destruction written all over it. As we rise up and zoom out of the detail, we see the edge of a massive storm swirling with fierce intensity and wrecking havoc on what is now a hair's breadth away on the screen. And then pulling even farther out, just beyond the edge of the planet is a swarm of meteorites firing down onto the human realm, one of which is the size of Long Island, it's always Long Island, and will soon wipe out all life on Earth. Picking up speed now, the camera zooms back and we see the solar system spinning, spinning around the fiery sun and see stars and galaxies and we return to a calm serenity where detail is a mere shades of color on a simple black canvas. Then the entire universe is swallowed into a black hole. Ship shape and under control. So the concept that the story is intended to convey is the concept of scale. Throughout this presentation, I want you to keep in mind the concept of scale. Many small components coming together to create more complex components that create other components with defined interfaces that together define many small components that come together to create more complex components with well-defined interfaces that come together to create components that come together to create components that combine in complex ways to create components with well-defined interfaces, etc., etc. And remember that while all those things are different at different scales, everything still matters. And to drive that home, think about when you have a cold the effects that you feel at your scale of your body are caused 
at, at scales that were unknown to humans for most of human history. Everything matters at all the scales. So how do we make sense of all of this complexity? So one way to frame complexity is via something called the Kinevan framework. It is a sense-making framework where we discuss about our disposition towards the systems out in the world. And we can look at the world and consider systems to be ordered or unordered. In the ordered case, we can conceive of systems that appear to be simple. And the way we'll define simple here is by the relationship between cause and effect. And, and for a simple system, the relationship between cause and effect is obvious. As an example, if I were to drop this clicker, it would fall down and it would be obvious to everybody why that happened. You didn't really need to do an analysis. You would categorize it as things fall down, thing fell down, you, you see the cause and effect, I dropped it. Um, another type of ordered system that we conceive of is a complicated system. And in the framing of relationship between cause and effect, these type of systems require analysis. An example here would be a car engine, for, where if there's a fault in a car engine, you might have to do some analysis, see which components are failing or not, and then determine the cause of the, cause of the problem. Now, another interesting bit about complicated systems, another way to kind of explain what they are is you can take them apart into pieces, and then you can then assemble pieces back together and it will continue to work. So a car engine, an airplane, most mechanical systems function this way. On the unordered side of the systems, we can conceive of systems that appear to be chaotic. And this will define as where there's relationship between cause and effect is non-existent. There is no relationship. An example would be like I'm walking through a forest and trees start exploding. Right? It, it would feel very chaotic from my perspective of what is going on, and we would usually wouldn't consider to analyze and think about the system. We would just act to get out of that situation. And then the other type of unordered um, system we can conceive of is a complex system. Um, this one I find the most interesting, uh, where we define the relationship between cause and effect is only knowable in hindsight. Um, and to illustrate that, consider that if I ask you one year ago to conceive of all the ways of you going to end up sitting here at the stock listening to me, it would be an impossible task. But if I ask you right now and go back a year, depending on your memory, you would be able to pinpoint every decision that you've made that led you to this moment. This is an example of knowing something only in hindsight. Um, and another, and compared to the complicated um, systems, the complex systems, another way to frame it is when you take it apart into pieces, when you put it back together, it won't work. It wouldn't work for me, for example. Like me personally into pieces and putting back together. And then the other aspect of looking and making sense of the world is this order. And this is the case where we have no idea which one of these we are in. And a lot, of our, a lot of us spend quite a bit of time in this order. So for our purposes here, let's focus on differences between complex and complicated as the way, the way they're framed here. And this is crucial distinction to understand. So we're going to spend some time. Why is it that we can predict some things in the complicated domain where we can plan things out, we can design machines, put them together, and they work. And in a complex, we can only know things in hindsight. Like, why is that? Let's say we want to go ahead and take a picture of Pluto. We'll do some math. We'll figure out which way we want to go. We launch a spaceship that travels for nine and a half years, 3.26 billion miles, and gets within 7,759 miles of Pluto and will take some pictures. Like, how do you even conceive of going about doing this? What condition makes such a feat possible? And a key observation to make here is that laws of physics don't change on the time scale that we care about. 
In other words, the constraints that we are operating with remain fixed in the time scales of whatever it is that we're doing. So in the Pluto probe that's in the time scale of physics, the laws of physics are a relevant constraint for that, op for that mission and they didn't change. So you can probably guess the nature of constraints in a complex system and that is that constraints change under time scales that we're considering uh, acting in. And in particular, they change due to agent actions. So what is an example of a constraint changing due to agent action? So a pursuit of a career changes our constraints. Like we pursue opportunities now associated with that career and not the other one. Attending this ch talk changed your constraints. You had to schedule things now in order to attend. Uh, if you're on call getting paged by machine, that changes your constraints. And we now need to drop whatever we're doing and resolve the issue. So almost every action we take as people changes some constraints in some way. So let's recap. We've talked about scale and that things matter. We've talked about complexity, where cause and effect relationship is knowable only in hindsight, and where every action we take changes some constraints that we operate with. So let's now look at the effect of complexity on our ability to scale. And we'll do that through the lens of the universal scalability law. Imagine I have an item of work. The length of this segment represents how long it will take to execute the work. Now let's add a worker. And it'll take a single worker this long to finish the work. Okay, simple example. Now let's divide this work into four shards and it will still take the worker this amount of time to accomplish the work. So if we want to go faster, one thing we can do is we can divide the work. And now with four workers, we can complete the work in one quarter of the time. Okay, it's a very straightforward model. There's no surprises here. Um, so what this graph depicts is the concept of linear scalability. That is, the more workers we have, the faster we can accomplish the work. So the function x of n is the throughput given n workers. Gamma in this case is equal to one. So we have five, five workers give us five throughput, 10 workers give us 10 throughput. Now our model is so far missing an aspect of what it actually takes to do work in the, in the real world. So the extra segments here, they represent the additional time required for distributing and integrating these work shards. We can also think of this as contention or queuing or waiting for a resource. So our first worker here has to hand out the work to the other workers and then they have to assemble the work back together. Notice that this distribution and integration adds, adds some time to accomplish the work. And this line is a little bit longer than the quarter line that we had before. So accounting for this contention, queuing, waiting aspect of the system, we end up with Amdahl's law. We add it to the denominator of the equation, the component that represents contention, sigma, and it is the fraction of the work that cannot be parallelized. So that's that, that first worker distributing the work and then bringing it back together. That's not the parallel piece. So even with 1% or 0.01 of the work being serialized in this manner, we, we start seeing the diminished throughput on the graph. But waiting and queuing is not the only thing that, that impacts our ability to accomplish work. What happens when the workers need to start coordinating with each other? Each worker now makes other workers do extra work due to this coordination overhead. And this, this is bad. This is O n squared bad. In that, here's a visual example of O n squared growth. This is the nature of coherence. Which is, where is, which is the delay for data to become consistent or coherent by virtue of point-to-point -point exchange of data between resources that are distributed. So we can see how much coordination we need to do with five workers, with seven workers, with 12 workers. So accounting for the coherence aspect of the system, we end up with the universal scalability law. 
So we added once again to the denominator of the equation, and the component that represents coherence, kappa, represents this percentage of work due to this crosstalk and coordination on top of contention that we've done previously. With kappa set as low as 1% or 0.01, .01, we already see the point of diminishing returns. And so work with one, so this graph depicts work, work with 1% contention and 1% coordination. And 10 workers is the point after which we get diminishing returns in that scenario. Now for context, five minutes of an eight hour workday is 1%. So if your work consists of less than five minutes a day of coordinating and less five minutes a day of waiting, raise your hand. Right? Um, and I also want to highlight the range of a two pizza team, which typically is seven plus or minus five, and this is kind of where it falls on this, con this universal scalability log graph. Um, so what? Well, we're not gonna get exact numbers out of, out of this formulation, but what we need to take away of it from this is that coordination kills throughput. And it's not a lot of coordination, just a tiny, tiny bit kills a lot of throughput. So let's recap. We've talked about scale and that things are different at different scales, yet everything matters. We've talked about complexity, where cause and effect relationship is knowable only in hindsight, and where every action we take changes some constraints we operate with. And we've talked about the universal scalability law, where we learned that coordination kills throughput. Okay, but isn't this supposed to be about SLOs? So here we go. Let's build an organization as if scalability, complexity, and the universal scalability law mattered, and see where the SLOs fit in. So we'll start with a solo contributor. The scale that we're working at is person scale, so it's single people. And the complexity is com contained within one mind. Contention is limited to one person doing the work. And then the coherence is at maximum. Now we want to get more work done, and so we're going to grow our team. The scale is still at one person. We now have two people. And we've introduced a complexity of one feedback loop between the two people to coordinate. And contention-wise, we can now do two, uh, twice the work, and there's hardly any drop-off. And so the coherence is still pretty good. We want to get more work done, so we grow our team to five. The scale is still at one person scale because we still just have five people working. But now the complexity is growing to 10 feedback loops. We're starting to see a drop off. Lots of work can still happen, but now for five workers, we're getting four of throughput. We wanna get more work done, and so we grow our team again, now to 10. And we're still thinking and looking at the person scale here, but the complexity now is up to 45 feedback loops between these 10 people. And lots of work still could happen, and we've actually increased throughput, but now we're getting to the point where after this we're gonna hit diminishing returns. So how do we grow past here? Do the obvious thing, we create teams. So we're gonna split into two teams. Now the scale, notice what happens here, we start shifting the scale. We now go from a scale of persons to now to the scale of teams, okay? And We've broken up the complexity so that each team now goes back to, that, to just having five people and, and they have the only 10 feedback loops each within the team. And so almost full two teams of work can happen. Now, that seems like too straightforward, so let, let's see this again in finer detail and slow motion. So let's visualize the feedback loops between people which is what the thing that correlates with complexity and this coherence penalty. When we split into the two teams, what happens to those feedback loops is crucial. If we do not eliminate the feedback loops when we split into the two teams, we haven't managed to address the coherence penalty throughout. So by eliminating these feedback loops required between teams to deliver work, we increased each team's coherence at the scale of people, right? We have, still have 10 people, and instead of 10 people having all the 45 feedback loops, we split them into two teams, and now five people just need 10 feedback loops because they're working together. And so notice while the arrow points from 10 to five people and the work throughput goes from five to four, remember that we have two teams. So the throughput 
kind of heuristically here goes to actually to eight. It's two times four, right? So we went, we had still 10 people. We had throughput of five. We went to two teams. Now we have throughput of eight total. Now also I want to point out that eliminating those feedback loops between people doesn't mean like never talking to each other, right? The implication is that for our daily work, we don't need to, we should not coordinate with the people from the other teams. Um, you can still be friends and talk, and that's not the type of talking I'm talking about. Once the teams are coherent, that allows the organization then to shift from the scale of people into the scale of teams. And now let's add that feedback loop back into the teams, and the, you know, here it is depicted. And so we have a feedback loop, but what is it? What does this consist of? Well, this is an example of an API. And this is kind of why APIs are useful. So we're almost to SLOs, but first let's go through what happens when this API that I've depicted is missing, all right? So notice that, that we, the way we arrived as this API between teams is that by eliminating those inter-team feedback loops between the people, and again, another name for inter-team feedback loop between people is a conversation or interaction or coordination. So if I don't have this type of API to call, or this API is inadequate, then I have to engage with another team member, say Ashley here, and I have to coordinate. And we're friends and we're helpful, and so we're gonna help each other out and then work got done. And everything's great. Now, I'm gonna pause here for a second and just wanna highlight that to keep in mind there are things here happening at two different scales, right? And we're shifting back and forth. We have the team scale, which and the communication between teams is happening at the team scale, but it's over the top of the person scale where I am talking to Ashley, right? So there are two scales at play, but they're both important. Now recall that coordination destroys throughput. And just a tiny bit of it is enough to destroy most of the benefits. So when the two of us, Ashley and I, come to an agreement, Juan now wants to make some changes, and Ashley points out that I'm doing a specific thing per our arrangement, so Juan coordinates their changes with me. Meanwhile, Ashley became the go-to person for the thing, and so I tell Brianna to talk to Ashley, and one thing leads to another, and slowly we are rebuilding this complexity that we worked so hard to contain. And most, import most importantly, we lost the benefits of the team scale that we've established, and we're now shifting the actual organizational work back down to the person scale with the coherence penalty that entails. So we can now finally explain why SLOs are useful. So let's assume we've avoided all the traps of the API inadequate, and it works great. We're communicating in the team scale, we're efficient, we have this one feedback loop between teams, teams are coherent, within each other. What happens when I make an API call and get an error response? Well, I have to engage with another team member, say Ashley here, to coordinate. I tell Ashley that I'm getting errors and I don't want errors, and Ashley looks into the problems and tells me that it's expected or not, and we're friends and we're helpful, and so we help each other out and work got done. And so when the two of us come to an arrangement, I, Juan now wants to make some changes, and Ashley points out that I have specific performance expectations per our arrangement. So Juan coordinates their changes with me. Meanwhile, Ashley became the go-to person for the thing. And so I tell Brianna to talk to Ashley, and one thing leads to another, and slowly we are rebuilding the complexity we work so hard to contain. We are shifting once again our work from the team scale to people scale, losing the scalability benefits we introduced by team, by the teams, and this is all despite having well-defined and well-established working APIs, because we're talking about performance issues. So, where we have an API in order to restrict inter-team coordination required between individuals regarding the functionality between teams, thus allowing our organization to shift towards the team scale, we have SLOs in order to restrict inter-team inter coordination required between individuals regarding the performance between the teams, thus allowing our organization to shift towards the team scale. But wait, there's more. 
So recall this complex versus complicated framing. Recall that in a complicated domain, we were able to plan for the future. Whereas in the complex domain, um, because we know only things in hindsight and every agent action changes the constraints, we have to be in a constant feedback loop of our environment to react appropriately. We take an action, environment changes, we observe, we take an action, environment changes, we observe. So it's a constant feedback loop. And then recall relationship between the domains and the rate of change of constraints. Where in a complicated domain for when we're looking at something and treating it as complicated, the constraints tend to be fixed. And in complex, the constraints tend to change. When we have teams with APIs and SLOs, the APIs and SLOs serve as a way to reduce the rate of change of constraints that the teams have to deal with. So think about what a stable API and a stable SLO can offer between the teams. In essence, it means that while within my team, I am dealing with the complexity of everything that is happening. I am constantly engaged in a feedback loop with my systems. I understand everything and I react constantly. I can treat all my dependencies behind API and SLO abstraction as complicated. And this is because there are people on those teams dealing with their complexity and they can treat all their dependence behind API and SLO abstraction as complicated. So this is why SLOs are useful. SLO is this complicated container that encapsulates complexity so that at our organizational scale, we can shift to team scales and we can accomplish more. And the same thing with an API. So, so far I've been trying to get across the important difference between this complex and complicated domains. But now let's take a closer look, let's go a little farther and take a closer look at the complexity in our business context. So that we get a better idea whether or not the SLOs that, create, that we create um, are actually well formed and achieve the goal of reducing complexity. Uh, to get at the fine-grained structure of complexity in the business context, we'll use Wordly maps. This is a Wordly map. In particular, this is an example map for an online photo service from 2005. So let's take a moment to familiarize ourselves with the various concepts in the Wordly map so that you'll be able to get the gist of the maps I show next. The map is visual and context-specific. In other words, it is unique in the line, to that line of business containing the components that influence it at that moment in time. So again, online photo service for a specific thing in 2005. The map has an anchor, which is the customer. The position of components in the map are shown relative to that customer on a value chain represented by the vertical axis. Each component needs the component below it. The closer to the customer and the higher up on the vertical axis, the more visible the component is to the customer. Farther down on the vertical axis, the less visible the component is to the customer. For example, the customer cares about online photos, which requires storage, which requires a data center and power. And the data center and power are gonna be hardly visible to the customer. The components of the map also have a stage of evolution, which is the horizontal axis. So on the left, the genesis represents the unique, the very rare, the uncertain, the constantly changing, and the newly discovered. Our focus here is on exploration. Custom built represents the very uncommon and that which we still are learning about. It is individually made and tailored for a specific environment. It is bespoke. It frequently changes, it is an artisan skill, and you wouldn't expect to see two of these that are the same. Our focus here is on learning and our craft. Next is product including rental, and this represents increasingly common. The manufactured through a repeatable process, the more defined, the better understood, change becomes slower here. And while there exists differentiation, particularly in the early stages, there is increasingly increasing stability and sameness. You will often see many of the same product. Our focus is here on refining and improving. And then we have commodity, including utility, and this represents scale and volume operations of production. 
the highly standardized, the defined, the fixed, and the undifferentiated, the fit for a specific known purpose and repetition. Repetition and more repetition. Our focus here is on the ruthless removal of deviation, on industrialization, and operational efficiency. With time, we become habituated to the act. It, increase, it is increasingly less visible, and we often forget that it's even there, like a power and a power plug. And the components continu continuously move from left to right in an evolution axis driven by the market forces. So that's a map. And there's a lot to worldly mapping that we aren't going to begin cover here, but one aspect I want to highlight is the, uh, this aspect of movement. The fact that components change as they evolve towards commodity and utility. So take a note here on, of the characteristics on the genesis side of the evolution axis and compare them to the characteristic, characteristics on the commodity side. On the left, we have uncertain, unpredictable, poorly understood, competitive advantage. On the right side, we have ordered, known, stable, obvious, operational efficiency, cost of doing business. So if we view these through our previous framing, we can see that components go from being thought of as complex to eventually being thought of as complicated. If we go back now to the idea that creating APIs and SLOs contains complexity in a complicated container and allows us to scale, we see that those same techniques help us provide stability and enable us to be viewed as complicated by the users of our APIs and SLOs. And these techniques allow us to shift our service and components closer and closer towards commodity utility. It's like, okay, fine, and so what? Like, why does that matter? And then the business context, this is where the business context becomes relevant, is shifting towards commodity means that we will start getting efficiencies brought on by commodity and utility. It enables innovation and creation of new sources of worth on top of those commodities and utilities. A shift towards commodities stabilizes the system, it freezes the constraints, and this in turn allows others to generate new complex things on top of stable, complicated commodities and utilities. And in turn, those complex things become stable over time. And we invent new complex things on top of those, and so on and so forth, and thus allowing us to survive in, this, in the business environment while, while continuing to play the infinite game. So before, we said that this is why SLOs are useful, but now you hopefully have a better idea of what this nebulous accomplish more means. It implies that commoditization allows us to generate new complex sources of worth. And that's sort of why we're all here, and that's how we can keep playing the infinite game. And that's all I got, and I can take some questions and answer, and I guess everybody else can too.